holiday. I'm on annual leave. You know what that means? Means you're finally going to work on the garden? That's not what I was going for. <laughs> you know what that means. Two oh, weeks off. Oh, you've no got to clean out the garage. No. I want to play games. Oh, I guess I'll allow it. The Gaming Lovers Podcast. With Brendo and Jem. G'day and welcome to episode 69 of the Gaming Lovers Podcast. I'm Jem. I'm a free man. I'm Brendo. <laughs> not Freeman like Gordon Freeman. I'm not Brendo Freeman. I am a free man from the shackles of employment for a mere two weeks, but we're not going anywhere. There's no holidays planned. It's going to be a couch holiday, which I have not had in quite a long time. Mm. So I'm looking forward to having a higher percentage of video games played. You can hear the excitement in my voice. <laughs> Might be the double coffee I've just had. But we're here to talk video games. We're here to talk a little bit of mm, somewhat serious topic compared to our usual what video game characters' socks do you like best? Or the other, you know, really... Can we do a whole episode based on that, please? <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, it's it's been a bit of a tumultuous time, especially with the three mass shootings in America, and then uh, President Trump saying that violent video games make people violent, and Walmart then removing uh, like promotional images and posters for any games that they deemed violent mm. uh, to be taken down and things like that. So we decided, you know. We have have defended video games before and we have debunked that myth of violent games making people violent. You can check that out in episode 25, Myths and Misconceptions. But in this episode, instead, we're going to look at the positives. Constructive. Yeah, the good things that uh, video games have taught us personally, the things that they've brought to our lives to enrich our lives, to help us grow as people. The skills we've picked up, the natural abilities that have been enhanced through years of playing video games. Mm -hmm. I do not yet have square eyes, thankfully. <laughs> We went to widescreen TVs, <laughs> so they have become oblongs. <laughs> oh, man, the, the crazy myths and things that you hear. Yeah, we don't want to talk negative stuff. We're talking positive things in the main body of this topic. But before we get there, mm -hmm. it's time for... Gaming Goals! Wow. We are in synchronization today. <laughs> yeah, unlike other weeks where we've just been so off. That was nice. Nice work. I liked it very much. Okay. Uh, so let's start off with our joint gaming goal with Divinity. Divinity Original Sin. Mm -hmm. uh, surely, surely we had a play session this week that was completely free of any uh, frustrating reloads, <laughs> no misplaced steps leading to mm. instant death, uh, and all the other pitfalls that we've been encountering on every other session of the, Divinity. The theme of Divinity this week has been, we've literally started it up a couple of times and gone, you know what, I'm just not in the mood to deal with this right now. Let's play something else. Do you want to play Divinity? Yeah, let's play Divinity. Mm -hmm. You're alone, you're like, oh, we were here. Oh, forget this. <laughs> <laughs> and then we managed to get past that. Well, I think we we skirted around that and then we started exploring a different section and then we hit another wall and we're like, you know what? Let's play something else. <laughs> There's a stealth aspect to this game. You can disguise yourself mm. as a rock or as a shrub. I don't know where they get the paper mache materials for this, just <laughs> out of nowhere. But enemies have cones of vision, Metal Gear Solid style. You ha avoid that and you can get right behind enemies. It's fine. Unfortunately, there's also like almost medieval security cameras, we'll call them, yeah. sentinels, that if they detect you, you will die instantly yes. on many occasions. Yes. And sometimes their movement is slow and deliberate and goes in like a complete 360 degree revolution around the room. So as long as you're slow and you stay out of that field of vision, you're fine. And sometimes they just spin at uh, random intervals and mm -hmm. directions and Very frequency. Very suddenly. And... I'm just like, this isn't fun. I don't mm. want to do this bit. Forget it. We've been trying to get into a big main plot point temple and we're stumped <laughs> as to how to get in. We're stumped. Even when we're looking at video game guides, we're stumped because we don't know 
where we are in relation to the main quest as far as that goes. I so. think we might be slightly underleveled as well. From a lot of the recommendations, we, I think, are sitting at like level 16 or 17. And I think we're supposed to be <laughs> level 20. <laughs> well, we couldn't even beat a army of rats last week. So we Excuse had some me, issues. We did. <laughs> it was not an easy fight, but we still beat them. <laughs> I think we've missed some other side missions maybe we were supposed to do to help uh, buff ourselves up before we then wandered off into this area. Because very early in the game, we felt almost overpowered. We're like, oh, this is so easy. We're like just annihilating all these enemies. And now I think we've like jumped past something and now it's like oh my goodness every fight takes hours to get through yeah. we survive but like just because we're so good at strategy yeah. how dare the ai counter our wonderful tactics that we've used without <laughs> fail since the start of the game we will summon a spider we will do this oh now they're just instantly killing summons well that's unfair it nobody is. wants that in their gameplay this is stripping the fun I'm, I have added so many dead spiders to that poor arachnid family that I keep summoning members from. I've, I've never felt so guilty about killing a spider as I have in this game. <laughs> Anyways, so that's been our week with Divinity. What else have you been playing, Brendo? I love how our entire Divinity update is. We're just frustrated and we're stuck and we're losing. Sometimes, so. that's, sometimes that's just how gaming is. Uh <laughs> you have been playing Persona Q2? I have indeed been playing Persona Q2. Uh, I set a gaming goal that I wanted to be finished with the second world in that game. I set that uh, challenge to myself last week. I set it to myself two weeks ago, and I still am yet to finish the second world. Hmm. Now, not my fault entirely, because the game structure is somewhat different to the first Persona Q there are missions in Persona games. You get given little side missions from the Velvet Room assistants, oh. and they want you to, whether it be collect a certain amount of this item, whether it's beat this new enemy that's stalking on level 16 of the dungeon, and he wasn't there before, but now can you beat him for an extra reward? All these little tasks that you get given, and Persona Q had them as well. Persona Q2 has them as well. But the difference in this one is, when they're in Persona Q2, the game I'm currently playing, it's not so much a little tiny mission, it's building around certain combinations of characters and the fun little interactions that they have. They have their own little mini mission to do, so it takes quite a bit more time than hmm. simply collect three of this. So you have an entire little storyline for those two, which usually finishes with a reward of a combined special unity attack or whatever. So I've been doing those, and they just keep coming. So <laughs> I've just wanted to finish the second dungeon, and I still have not done it because I've been enjoying, thankfully I've been enjoying, the extra little side missions, mm -hmm. the special screenings, keeping with the cinema motif mm -hmm. of Persona Q2, New Cinema Labyrinth. It's been fun. Progress has been slow, but it's been an enjoyable slow, unlike Divinity, which has just been the frustrating slow, <laughs> where we want to make progress and we can't. This one, there's other things in my way, but I'm having a good time. We don't even have to try. It's, it's always, always a good, good time. time. Yes, it has been a good time. I love the entire Persona cast from three, four, five, and seeing new combinations, like I've said, is always a good thing if you have so much invested in these characters over, what, hundreds of hours at this point? Yeah. Easily. Persona 3. Yeah, easily. Hundreds. I'm enjoying it and have not hit the point where it is frustrating, which I know will come because I had that in Persona Q1. I was having a great time with that game until enemies started insta-killing. Uh, with their blessing and dark spells that mm. just annihilate your team, and bosses that take half an hour to beat, and it gets to the last 10% of their health, and they decide to throw out the big guns and almost kill you, and you get nervous. <laughs> there are some frustrations that are inherent with Japanese RPGs. Yes. Persona Q did definitely do that. I just know Persona Q2 will do it to me as well, but I've been <laughs> taking it slow, just a bit here and a bit there. No really big long sessions in that game. Maybe 40 minutes at a time. 
just keeping it, enjoying the gameplay loop and not letting it uh, outstay its welcome. Hmm. What else have you been playing this week? Let's go back and forth. Okay. Uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses has pretty much been my bread and butter. Mm. And last week, I believe I said I would do my best to get to the time jump, time leap, whatever you want to call it, time split in the game. Someone say time splitters? Did you say time splitters? That's a great (laughs) game. That needs to be revived immediately. (laughs) Uh, So I don't think it's too spoilerish to say that it jumps ahead several years. Well, I th- Awakening did that, I believe. It's, so It I happens don't know if a it lot in video in, games. I don't know if it happens in every Fire Emblem game. It, might, it may not be an inherent spoiler because it's how the games are designed. I don't know. But what has been so fun is kind of seeing all my students, like, kind of grown up because they were, like, in their late teens uh. in their, as students. I finally figured out how old everyone was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how old my character was. I found out I was 21. Well, now I would be... What? Well, don't tell us how long the okay, time true. jump is, because that I'm <laughs> very I'm overly cautious when <laughs> okay. it comes to spoilers. So, uh, but yeah, it's so fun to see them go from like teenagers to like young adults, basically, and come back and see some of them with beards or like just Ooh, a bit more matured bit and character even sometimes their voices are slightly different, which I think is excellent work on the voice actor's part to. Mm-hmm. Uh, pay attention to those smaller details. There's, yeah, there's just certain things I'm like, oh my goodness, what happened to this person? (laughs) And I can't say, like, I really want to mention who I'm talking about. So I'm sure Um, there's some characters that were perky and bubbly and then they've gone through some stuff in the past. There's been some serious stuff that's gone down that has broken a few of my students. So I am back to heal them. (laughs) 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 I'm going to try to fix everything. It's funny, early on I'm like, yeah, I'll probably get around to this game eventually so you can play if I'm in the room, it's all good. And now you have pretty much barred the doors to the gaming room. (laughs) If Fire Emblem is on, Brendo, you are not allowed in here. Yeah, I'm in deep spoiler territory right now. I'm like, you, you can come back in once I've finished the game. But then once I finish it, I'll probably be starting it again and trying a different house <laughs> because the story does change. Um, you'll be on different sides, I guess, of combat in some ways too, but uh, that's alluded to in the trailers. Yeah, yeah. But then um, there's one house that's kind of uh, does its own thing and has its own arc as well, which has been hinted at, and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Now I wish I'd picked that house because I want to do that. So I'm very tempted to like finish this and then quickly start up again. Thank you very much, Nintendo, for not splitting this into multiple entries like uh, Fire Emblem has done recently. Pokemon does mm. every time. Yokai Watch has done it in the past. Not so I mean, much. If you want to play one side, you've got to buy one game, like yeah. with Birthright and such. The Pokemon and Yokai Watch games, for example, the story's basically the same. It's just which creatures you can catch. But mm-hmm. the Fire Emblem games, Birthright and Conquest, were very different. Yep. And I don't like to have to buy the same game twice. <laughs> and if I can avoid it, I'd rather buy two different games and not play either as they sit on my shelf. But <laughs> I'm glad that this is all in one package. And from what I've heard from you, from the hours I've seen you invest in this yes. and the excitement you have about this game, I'm guessing it has exceeded your expectations on a character and story standpoint. Oh, totally. And I want to say more, but I feel like anything I would bring up as an example is, like, hugely spoilerific. Um, but I I love the, the cut scenes and things, and I love that there's actual animated scenes and things that suit, reg- like, which gender you've chosen to. So that helps me kind of get really pulled into the story. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's, like, minor things that bug me, but... Overall, it's just such a good game, and uh, the fact that I want to jump in and play like a new game plus right away, even though I don't have, you know, trophy hunting to motivate me, which is mm-hmm. a big factor. Uh, it's <laughs> it probably shouldn't motivate me as much as it does, but oh. a lot of the time I will grind and do all those repetitive things in games if I know I'm gonna earn some points. (laughs) I agree completely. If there's a game that's on the Nintendo Switch, for example, and the PS4, Mm -hmm. it's the exact same game, I will almost always lean to the PlayStation or the Xbox because you do have that extra incentive to replay 
in the form of trophies or achievements. So exactly. I understand that. But mm-hmm. it's good that you are enjoying a game and not entirely <laughs> obsessed yes. beyond relief, beyond belief with trophies and achievements. Yeah, and I think that speaks very highly of the game, that even though it doesn't have that, I still want to play it repeatedly. So, uh, yeah... I want to say more, but I'm not going to. Like, a part of me really wishes that we did episodes just about spoilers. <laughs> They'd be very focused. <laughs> they would be very, Targets. Yeah. Like, just talk all about this one game in great detail, uh, which then Brendo would never listen to because spoilers. <laughs> It'd be a special episode, which I would just believe is non-canon. <laughs> not part of the true gaming lover's timeline. <laughs> Uh, so that has been my week. It's just been Divinity and Fire Emblem Three Houses. I feel like I'm getting closer to the end. I'm not sure, but time will tell who gets the TV this week with you on leave. Mm. Uh, we'll we'll t- have to do opposing 12-hour shifts. <laughs> uh, what else have you been playing? Well, I've been enjoying Vampire, V-A-M-P-Y-R, which mm-hmm. was actually never explained why they <laughs> spelt it that way. I think they just wanted to use the the red Y, which is where the big major conversation branches come from, where you can only choose one, and it might be a nice thing to say, uh, hurtful but truthful things to say, and then just the jerky thing to say. In like a Mass Effect or a Life is Strange, you have those situations where you can only choose one of these things, mm-hmm. and that happens on the dialogue wheel in Vampire, and it has that icon to split them. So that's the only reason, I assume, why they called it Vampire with a Y, and that's not a good enough reason for it. It loses points based off that. <laughs> now, I don't know whether to call this game flawed yet brilliant or brilliant yet flawed. Which one sounds more benefit? I suppose flawed yet brilliant sounds the more positive spin, I think. Mm. I beat this game this week story-wise. I had nowhere near the expectation to enjoy the story to this degree. I know it's made by the developers, Don't Nod, who made Life is Strange, and I adored that narrative Mm -hmm. for the first season. Haven't played anything beyond the first season from those games yet, but I loved that. And for some reason, because this is an action RPG, I just didn't expect the story to be as good. Now, that is my opinion, because there have been some opinions that I've found on the internet. Believe it or not, some people on the internet have different opinions to me, (laughs) and they did not enjoy the story. And I don't know if it's just they made different choices than I did, Mm. and as a result, they bonded more with other characters that I didn't bond with as much, didn't feel a connection with. Maybe too many people died. The way that I role-played Dr. Jonathan Reed, he's a doctor. He has his Hippopotamus Oath, as I said (laughs) last time. Dr. Reed's Hippocratic Oath, the way that I played him, it demanded that he do his best to look after the citizens of this city. There is an epidemic, and he must try and cure it. Not, however, by any means necessary. He has morals and he has standards. There will be lines that he is not going to cross. That is how I played Vampire. I also tried to do a non-lethal run where I didn't directly feed on any NPCs. I made some bad choices, which resulted in a few deaths here and there, but I didn't feed on anyone. Didn't give in to my vampire needs to suck the XP out of people's necks and leave them as shriveled husks dead in the street. Because that's not what doctors should do, Mm. right? Am I wrong with that? (laughs) You also have the ability, once you learn more about the law, you can turn people into vampires and have them as your progeny. And I thought that Dr. Reed would be horrified by that, so he didn't do that at all throughout the entire game. That is how I played him. I was happy with the story, and I'm happy with the ending I got as well, because I wasn't sure how much would be illusion of choice, and how much would be actual different endings depending on different choices and levels of vampiriness. Mm-hmm. Now, you're obviously given a choice, which we've explained in other episodes, that you can kill NPCs, take the big plump XP bonus for doing so, but as a result, you'll have less information about the world, you'll have less side quests options available because that person is now gone from the game completely. Some people didn't feel that their choices when choosing who to murder, for lack of better term, (laughs) 
didn't line up with the ending they got, and they accused Vampire of having illusion of choice. This isn't fair. This isn't the way that I did it. I only killed the serial killer and the other person who was bad in this game, and why should I be punished for that? Now, (laughs) I love games. I love game design where you make a choice early on in the game, and you get punished for it much later. Life is Strange did that very well. A critical moment at the end of the second episode. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just what you chose in that conversation. If the stuff you did, if the conversations you had the five hours before that didn't line up, that person isn't going to believe you, and you are screwed. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love it. The Walking Dead by Telltale tried to do this as well, but I felt it would have been so much more impactful. There's a character who four episodes after it happens, accuses you and blames you for something that you may or may not have done. I would have liked that to have the consequence that if you did do it, you dealt with a consequence that much later in the game. Mm. The way Vampire is presented isn't so much a choice. Do you choose option A or do you choose option B? And then you deal with that choice. It's more of a temptation system Mm. because you get a massive reward for feeding on an NPC, but as a result, you're damaging your game and it may even affect your ending 20 hours later. And people don't like that long-term consequence in their games and they go, this game sucks as a result. (laughs) I think this game is bloody brilliant. Bloody for vampires because they love blood. I think it's brilliant. I loved the story. The actual game engine, ugh, I wish it was better. I wish it ran better. Particularly the big last final mission or two, and you have to collect these three items around the city, and they're around the entire bloody map. That's a frustration bloody, not a vampire bloody. (laughs) So you have to go from one part of the city up to the next and encounter like 12 loading screens as you get there. Then go to the next one and experience the same. And you're just trying to get through this gate to get to the next sector of the city and somebody wants to fight you and you're like, just let me get to it. That's frustrating. The combat still didn't feel super good. I didn't get too frustrated. Too frustrated with the combat. (laughs) But the story itself, the characters, I don't think I've played a game with this level of excellence when it comes to character development and the story. And that's my opinion because, like I said, other people didn't like the story. I loved the story. So if you are like me, if anything I've said over these past 68 episodes have aligned with your interest in games, maybe you will love Vampire just as much as I did. Mechanically, technically, game engine-wise, not the best game story character, one of the best games I've played in years, and that is my final verdict. I give it two pointy fangs up. (laughs) (laughs) Normally they're facing down, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you enjoyed it, and well done on finishing it. Thank you very much. It's just the way that they created their own sort of law about vampirism and using like we love in Assassin's Creed games, for example, using actual historical events Mm -hmm. and figures. There's one point where this all-knowing vampire rattles off a bunch of names from uh, history and says, you know, one of these is actually a vampire. And you're like, oh, I don't know which one it is, but that's very interesting. (laughs) Who would it be? That's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I really enjoyed it. And, yeah. My money's on Nostradamus. Oh. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> it just seems like you would be. <laughs> uh, so I guess we'll find out. I'm assuming that's all you've played this week. I also did finally load up Red Dead Redemption 2 again, oh, picking okay. that up where I left off to try and get through that in my holidays. Unfortunately, it's been so long since I played that game. Uh, the you controls <laughs> may be a bit uh, rough, and in the five-minute <laughs> session I played may have accidentally shot a shopkeeper in the heart and quickly quit the dashboard because I did not mean to do that. I've had some controller issues too because I've been playing so much (laughs) Fire Emblem on the Nintendo Switch. When I go back to the PlayStation to play Divinity with you, I keep hitting the wrong buttons because it's like uh, flipped, I guess, or mirrored, where, you know, the, the X 
the and confirm button yeah. and the cancel button are uh, like opposite The Japanese spots. way on the Nintendo. Yes. And the confirm button for us Westerners is usually the bottom button, whether it be an A on an Xbox or an X on the PlayStation mm-hmm. or cross, depending if you don't want any confusion. <laughs> Whereas for the Nintendo, it's the one on the right-hand side of the diamond. So, yeah. Yes. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, I had to slowly reprogram myself to do it correctly to play Fire Emblem because I'm so used to it on the PlayStation. And now when I go back to the PlayStation, I keep hitting the wrong thing. And I think that has uh, triggered many a uh, mishap <laughs> with my magic spells and accidentally <laughs> attacking party members when I don't mean to. Uh, yeah. So hopefully no more of that this week. Hopefully no more of that. We will find out what new games you'll be playing over the holiday break at the end gaming goals of this episode. Mm-hmm. Get to do some new stuff, yay. Yes. Uh, right now, though, we're going to jump into our main topic of ways that video games have positively influenced our lives after this. Share the love. Follow us on Twitter at Brendo Gem. That's B-R-E-N-D-O-J-E-M. Well, unfortunately, as has been the case over the past few decades, um, video games have been given a bad rap in the news recently, mm. as unfortunately, America did experience three mass shootings. Mm-hmm. President Trump points the finger and says violent video games are the problem. Having violent images become commonplace is what is causing these things to happen. We do not think that's the case, but we're not specifically focusing on the negative side of video games today. We're talking about the ways that our video gaming hobbies have positively influenced our lives, our characters, our skills, Mm -hmm. and the ways that they have helped us become better human beings, not worse. Absolutely. And just a reminder, if you do want to listen to the episode where we debunk a lot of myths and misconceptions about video games, specifically the one about making people more violent, listen to episode 25 of the Gaming Lovers podcast. And if you like the word debunk... As much as I do, <laughs> hope that Jim keeps saying it because I adore the word debunk. Uh, today, though, we wanted to share, uh, I guess, different ways that video games have really impacted our lives personally, and hopefully they've influenced and impacted you in this way as well, and maybe in other ways that we haven't even thought about. Mm. So, uh, I think one of the most obvious ones would have to be problem solving. Ugh. I've always liked puzzles. Mm -hmm. I've always liked, here is the goal, and you have these obstacles in the way. Sometimes they're physical obstacles, but even in video games, a simple platforming game, you see the flag at the top that you're trying to get to in a Mario game, and you're like, how the heck do I get up there? All right, if I head up there, no, there's a dead end there. All right, if I go on, oh, maybe I'll jump on top of this enemy, and he'll lift me up. Oh, there we go, now I'm one step closer. All that sort of thing, problem solving, logic problems, Professor Layton, Phoenix Wright. There are so many games that I love purely for the puzzle aspect, but puzzles are a main part in video games. I think they have helped make me a smarter problem solver in life as mm-hmm. well. Absolutely. They sharpen your brain, I think, depending on which type of video game uh, you're playing. It could be just pure puzzle games, Mm -hmm. which are proven to uh, sharpen minds, help fight off things like Alzheimer's and dementia. So that is incredibly important and powerful. It's undisputed at this point that video games can help exercise your brain. Mm. And whether that is simply expanding your mental abilities to solve real-life problems or to simply keep your brain healthy Mm -hmm. for longer. Uh, There's times where, you know, I haven't played a game in three days and then I think to myself, all right, what facts can I remember about these characters? And just recalling that saved information in my brain can help bring it back to life. But when it comes to actual real-life jobs, employment opportunities, uh, situations with your children. There's lots of things in life that would be, quote unquote, problems to be solved. Yeah. Not that children are problems. <laughs> uh, that's not what I meant. But oh, well, They can be at times. We all can. <laughs> my previous job where I would do steel shelving installations and relocations, things like that. Mm-hmm. My like second day on the job, we had a new type of shelving kit that the guy who was in charge of our two-man team 
had no idea how to put it together. He'd never done this type before. It was all little brackets and tubes to put together this desk. And he was stumped. <laughs> and I walk across and see these, you know, L L brackets. And then you got ones with three bits and you got bits four bits. And I'm like, okay, this one's obviously a corner. This one's obviously just an edge. And then I just start putting it together. <laughs> <laughs> while he sits there just pretty much watching because he couldn't understand how to put it together. Mm-hmm. It's like an Ikea kit without an instruction booklet is what <laughs> we were facing. So after I did all that, I we return back to base. The boss says, how do we go? And he just simply points at me and goes, this guy will fit in fine here because he did all the work today. I was useless. <laughs> Video games and that being able to visualize things in 3D and think, right, right this one's got four edges. So it's got to be the corner piece that has connects to three other pieces. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can see where this one works, this one works. Problem solving in games is fun. Problem solving in real life usually isn't. Mm-hmm. But the skills you pick up in games can apply to real life problems More often than you may think. Mm -hmm. One that comes to mind for me is Tetris. Tetris has uh, taught me how to pack efficiently, whether it be real (laughs) luggage for holidays. And I am meticulous. I like to pack everything so it fits and uh, like is snug and won't move as it gets thrown around. And I get really annoyed at airport security if they make me pull everything out because I perfectly packed my carry-on. Thank you very much. Meticulous judgmental. <laughs> if Jem walks past my suitcase <laughs> as I'm packing it, there will be judging eyes <laughs> looking down upon me you going... You just throw stuff in there. I travel lighter than you do. I have more room to move with. Ugh, it hurts me. It physically <laughs> hurts me to look at your luggage. Uh, another thing that Tetris has helped me with is, this is going to sound strange, but packing food in containers, like like leftovers, for example, getting them perfectly in like <laughs> so imagine you get like a doggy bag but they just bring you like a plastic uh container yep and you've got to try to fit everything in being able to place things perfectly and stuff like that in those containers those kind of remind me of playing tetris a little bit but also packing grocery bags oh yes at the supermarket and knowing <laughs> okay this this item is frozen and it shouldn't be touching anything that if it absorbs the water would then you know uh ruin the integrity of the product, like putting a tissue box next to frozen peas and carrots. Probably shouldn't do that. And I'll I'll maybe put this fragile thing next to these paper towels so that way it can cushion it and protect it from other stuff. And yeah, uh, you kind of imagine the grocery items like falling slowly (laughs) into the bag. (laughs) Catch the eggs, dear. Just please catch the eggs. (laughs) Just now, don't put them, like, sideways down, <laughs> like, because they look like that long piece in Tetris. Yeah. It should always be lying oh, horizontal and not vertical. <laughs> there is no doubt that this is an application of problem solving in real life, especially now that we have to p- pay for bags mm. at the supermarkets here in Australia. No more cheap plastic bags that stay in landfill forever. They're all biodegradable. They cost 15 cents a pop, a whopping 15 cents. Try to fit as much in as you can. (laughs) Yeah. And I look like the worst husband in the world when it comes to us two doing our grocery shopping because we get to the checkouts, the self-serve checkouts, and I basically just walk off because I know no matter how I pack them, (laughs) those judging eyes will be back. (laughs) So this is Jim's role. Go go for your life. One of my earliest jobs was working at Kmart as a checkout chick. So I have perfected the art of packing bags appropriately and making sure that you put the right things. Because, you know, you get told off if you pack them wrong. Uh-huh. So it's just a life lesson that stuck with me in that sense too. But I can see parallels and see how video games and puzzles have come into play there. As far as problem solving, though, I feel like that kind of ties in a little bit with my next point of ways that video games have influenced us in a positive manner, Mm -hmm. and that is making ethical and moral decisions. Oh, I've always loved ethical, (laughs) moral decisions in video games. It's kind of a problem-solving thing in and of itself, but it's usually to do more with the conversation aspects of video games and calming people down, talking people off a ledge kind of moments in games, which we've alluded to earlier in this episode, Mm -hmm. to 
deciding who you're going to invest time in building up relationship or bonding points, I guess, in certain games, uh, to making really big choices of do I destroy this community or do I save this town's infrastructure while it kills all the community? <laughs> like, which which do I save? Making those big uh Hard choices. Yeah, I've always liked branching narratives ever since I had choose your own adventure books as a young lad, mm-hmm. and you had the option do you do you go through the dark and scary cave, then turn to page thirty six? Otherwise, you're going through the forest, turn to page seventy two, <laughs> and all that sort of you know. I loved that choice. Mm. And when you combine that with actual dilemmas in games, yes. it's not just do you want to go in the cave or do you want to go in the forest? It's these two people are in a feud and you have to side with one of them. Who do you pick? Mm-hmm. And it's like both is not an option. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, they love employing Sophie's Choice in video games. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't really go easy on you in a lot of those. Uh, one of my favorite examples would have to be the uh, Zero Escape series. Yes. There are so many moments. It's not just hard puzzles, which in of itself taught me so much and made me like think on my feet in very stressful situations. But to try to weigh up whose life is worth more, do you go with this person or this person? Like All those kind of things... If you're helping one person and trying to save their life, but at the cost of another, like... The old trolley dilemma. Yes. It's the, a lot of really heavy topics, you know? Yeah. It, not every situation in life is you make this choice, you win. You make this choice, you lose. Mm. Sometimes we have lose-lose. Yeah, and totally. that's just part of life. <laughs> you mm-hmm. got a, a bad thing and a bad thing. Which one do you choose? Well, great. And then living with the consequences of those choices, too, I think is a really great lesson um, that most video games will hit home to. Whenever I play a game for the first time, I usually try and be a good person as best I can. And then on subsequent playthroughs, I just like to experiment a bit and see what would have happened. But in life, you know, you've got options in life where you can do morally grey or outright illegal things. Mm. When it comes to tax time, do you fudge the numbers a little bit to get a little bit of money back? These sort of things, if you've constantly (laughs) gone through moral dilemmas in games, you know what's right, you know what's wrong. Your Mm -hmm. conscience gets a little bit refreshed with this, and when it comes time to do the right thing, you should have had enough practice in video games to do the right thing. One that we've brought up repeatedly on this podcast as far as like ethical dilemmas, in the Knights of the Old Republic, the Sith Lords, with Kreia challenging you (laughs) on whether to give money to a beggar or not and regardless of what you do it has a bad outcome but it really (laughs) makes you think and go is it right to give money to someone who's begging should I help someone regardless of whether they're going to abuse that or not or if it's going to cost them their life or not like what do you do in that kind of circumstance yeah exactly and if you do want to give money to a beggar and there's another beggar in greater need down the road and you've just given your last five bucks away to the first one just the fact that you're actually thinking about it more i think is a good thing Mm. giving it more thought than just going yes or no okay they're my only two options Quite often there's more options, you just haven't thought about them. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to problem-solving, moral dilemmas in life, video games can help you think outside the box and look for other options that were not quite there. Absolutely. Or at the very least, just make you a bit more of a conscientious person. Ooh, big word. Mm -hmm. Present in the moment. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, There's so many games that fall into that category from pretty much almost every RPG that you play will throw those kind of decisions at you to some of those puzzle games as well. Uh, Even some shooters will occasionally throw some surprise curveballs at you Mm -hmm. and have you playing as a villain all along. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Things like that that make you go, wait, am I really actually fighting for the right side or am I the bad guy here? Which I think brings in a lot of questions about what is the real purpose of war and who's really benefiting from it. I love that in Metal Gear Solid. I was going to say that exactly. It's more than just choice because moral dilemmas, sometimes you will just be a soldier Mm. and your country is being attacked by someone else. Well, we're defending our country. Over 10 years' time, your country can change leadership. 
Mm-hmm. It can change its stance with other relations to other countries. Suddenly, over the, suddenly over 10 years, I was about to say, <laughs> but you know what I mean. You suddenly realise. Over those 10 years, maybe your country isn't the good country anymore mm-hmm. and you're still a soldier for them and you have to follow their orders. Are you doing the right thing by following their orders or are you now part of the problem? Mm-hmm. We need to know what we're thinking about in life. And these are the sort of things that video games tell in incredible stories yes. that help you think about reality. Totally. Whether you are willing to follow anything blindly or if you will challenge that or you will take it into some more consideration at the very least. Mm. So many ways that they are thought-provoking. So I think that's one of the big lessons that we've definitely learned personally from video games. Yeah, and in a different role to just simply watching a movie or reading a book because Mm. of the interactive nature of video games, you do have more choice. Yes, and it feels like you're the one that's going, oh, I've I've stuffed up. It's not just, oh, this character stuffed up. I've stuffed up. Oh, the programming stuffed up. Uh, next on our list of positive influences from video games, it has definitely helped with strategic thinking. Ooh. Yes. Me personally, especially as I've been playing Fire Emblem Three Houses, my strategy, I feel like I, I don't really play chess, but this <laughs> feels a little bit like that. Yep. Uh, especially because it's grid formatted and everything and you have so many moves and different skill things will have pros and cons to them and weighing up what should be attacking what, Mm -hmm. has really sharpened the way I strategized, at least in that sense. But that can bleed into real life as well as you approach different things or different people even and how you're going to talk to them. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <laughs> always go into a conversation three steps ahead. <laughs> Sometimes, well, some people you kind of do need to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's always uh, someone out there who likes to trap you with your own words. So oh. thinking ahead can help. Why, why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to do that with you as much these days. Thank goodness you're not as argumentative as you used to be a decade ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll just agree. <laughs> But you love your strategy games. Oh, I even, like, from games of real-time strategy like Warcraft, Starcraft, they used to play back in the day, Total Annihilation, KKND, all these sort of strategy games, which are defined as strategy games. Mm -hmm. But you do have to balance multiple tasks at once. Okay, we're going to have this barracks making 12 knights, and then over here I go, oh, hang on, these guys aren't quite as efficient in gathering resources as they could be, so I'll reshuffle their timing and things like that. An enemy's coming to scout me. I should probably chase him down, but he's already left. Do I chase him down? Eh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It's all about juggling a few things. Mm-hmm. And like you said, with Fire Emblem, you can't just go character by character, step by step, what's he going to do right now? What's this character going to do right now? You sort of work it as a team, and you're like, okay, if he's going to go around the left side, the enemies can still make it to my other guys that I'm trying to defend down the right-hand path. So I'll send two guys that way to to block up that path. And you're sort of balancing a few things. And if you're a supervisor at work, if you're a leading hand at a job site, Mm -hmm. you have to do that. You have to allocate your resources and your staff correctly. I was a leading hand at that shelving job. I had to do that, those sort of things and allocate tasks and try to balance. It works with time management as well. Mm, totally. In video games that have time management, some people get stressed out <laughs> to no end. With yes. Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is not a game I don't think you would enjoy. <laughs> Too much uh, time restriction. The Dead Rising series gets so much flack for its constrictive time-based missions. Someone's in danger in a shopping centre that's overrun with zombies. You kind of have a time limit on that if it was a real-life situation. Exactly. They're not just going to sit in the local coffee shop and wait for 12 days until you go, I'll get around to you soon. You have different missions that have different time availabilities, Mm -hmm. and you might be right next to a mission that you're like, well, I should just do this one, right? I'm like 12 seconds from activating it. But that one has a much larger time span and would be quicker to do, or would take more time to do, I mean, than a mission that's on the other side that's starting to get critical. And Mm. you're like, well, I need to go over there now. I can always get this one later. Trying to balance that and make those decisions are things you face in life. When your boss gives you 12 projects to get through on your desk, 
you have to assess, all right, uh, well, that one I can't, I'm waiting to hear back from this person for that one, so mm-hmm. I'm not going to do that right now. Yep. You have to make these decisions, and in video games, you get practice at that sort of time management. Even just prioritising uh, how you will spend your time in your week, whether who in your friends and family are going mm-hmm. to make the effort to spend time with, uh, how much... <laughs> Trust me, I've got two weeks off and about 21 people I want to try and catch up with. It's not going to happen. Someone is going to have to get cut from the roster. It's just too much for me to handle. (laughs) Just even prioritising chores and things like that and managing your time so that you can still have fun in life but also get things done and that they don't become neglected and Mm -hmm. then become even bigger tasks that seem like they're never, ever going to get done like our backyard at the moment. Uh, (laughs) It is winter. It's growing far slower than normal. (laughs) But, yeah, I think the strategic thinking and the time management definitely come into play. When we play things like Persona and you've got so much time, like, or so many sessions, like you can hang out with this person this day and this person and this person's available and trying to figure out literally planning your week. (laughs) It's like, okay, I'm going to hang out with this person and work on that social link. And then over here, oh, I really need to study on this because this exam's coming up. It literally is like a tutorial on how to balance and meticulously down to the second plan your life guide. And not just plan it out because then you've got it perfectly set set up and this NPC calls you up on the day that you've already got booked out basically and says, can we hang out? I kind of need to talk to you. And you're like, <laughs> I guess I'm going to fail that exam on Friday because I've only got my study time to give you. Let's go for it. So yeah, mm-hmm. sometimes you got to adjust on the fly. And that's why when it comes to situations in real life, mm-hmm. I like to have a loose plan But I'm very flexible as far as, ah, well, that plan can get adjusted and we'll actually do that in the evening, not the afternoon. And I don't have any problem with that. And I think that's because video games have taught me to be flexible with my time management. Totally. One thing that pretty much flies in the face of the theory that video games make people more violent or encourage violence, uh, for me, I have learned the value of life time and time again from video games. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, especially... Uh, in recent years, really beautiful, emotional, poignant games like That Dragon Cancer, things that highlight uh, how precious life is and your whole point of the game is trying to preserve and protect life Mm -hmm. as opposed to taking it. And games that make you sob, (laughs) you know, (laughs) they're so beautiful. Uh, There's so many that illustrate that Uh, and a lot of story-based video games, I would say, are really the ones that highlight that especially. Mm Mm-hmm. Life is Strange, uh, pretty much any game that those uh, developers have made uh, very much force you to think about the brevity and the preciousness of life, how mm-hmm. it's fleeting, but it's you know it's got to be protected. Yeah, there's almost no media out there that uh, every TV show, every movie, every book, that someone always meets a tragic end, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Mm. But you get to know these characters in media, whether it be video games or movies or whatever, And you get to know them, you get to bond with them a little bit, and then they're taken away. Yes. (laughs) And it's just a snapshot of our actual... Human condition. Our human condition, our real friendships and relationships, and not to put it down on everything, but we should be making the most of enjoying their company while they're there. Exactly. And it's, it's a good reflection in a condensed version that life can be short, life can be strange, but... We should appreciate the people in our lives and not take them for granted. Totally. And that is something I have definitely got from video games. We'll be back with more positive ways that video games have impacted our lives after this. You're listening to the Gaming Lovers Podcast. Want to join the conversation? Visit thegaminglovers.com. Record your comment or question by clicking on the button on the right-hand side and you could be featured in the next podcast. When people have... Oh, bleh. <laughs> the end. A bit uncoordinated there, are we? <laughs> oh, you cheeky girl. <laughs> when people have asked me in years gone by, why are you so good at everything? I say, <laughs> listen here, I play video games all the time. 
And as a result, I'm excellent when it comes to coordination (laughs) and ability to speak word (laughs) and learn to be (laughs) that. In all seriousness, though, video games do teach a lot of hand-eye coordination. Mm -hmm. I've always believed that. I used it as my excuse when asking my mother, can I please play the Sega Master System for half an hour before dinner? It will make me more coordinated and improve my hand-eye coordination, please. And she's like, you are like, seven years old, why are you giving me such a complex explanation of why you want to play video games? I think it's true, though. You, If you have ever sat and watched someone play a uh, first-person shooter or anything that requires active control movements, mm-hmm. watch that controller. Watch that keyboard and mouse. You'll be amazed at all the micro little movements that hands do, that the brain is telling as a result of what the eye is showing them. Mm-hmm. It's incredible oh, and yeah. a little weird. I used to love when we played, when myself and my good buddy the Falcon would play Guitar Hero. Just watch the fingers. Mm-hmm. It's just like, wiggle, 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 and it's doing it perfectly. And how do you control that? I don't know. It's brain. <laughs> and a bit of muscle memory. Uh, but that's the same could be said about you know musical instruments. But there is a bit of correlation there as far as picking up rhythm and coordination from you know, actual rhythm games, Yeah. Uh, you get coordination from things like Dance Dance Revolution, which is, <laughs> you know, some physical exercise too. You see people that do like the insanely hard levels and I am always in awe, like watching them and just how fast their feet are moving. I'm like, how are you not falling over? I would be completely in the middle of an asthma attack if <laughs> I was trying to keep up. Yeah. And you it, know? it is incredible watching progress of people who even have never played a video game before. Um, I was a young lad when I started to play games. I'm sure I had neuroelasticity in my brain and was able to pick things up much quicker mm-hmm. than an older generation. But my mother, who was kind of against games early on, saying they're <laughs> a waste of time and it's going to rot your brain. Same thing was said about books when they first came out. How dear those uh, books. Oh, my you goodness. You should memorise every bit of information given to you. That's legit what they said. <laughs> she started playing games like Spyro the Dragon. And she'd come up to an enemy who's standing there. He's big. He's huge. You can't headbutt him. Okay, mum, you're going to have to shoot fire at him to beat this one. How do I shoot fire? It's the circle button. Okay, let me look at my controller. Um, ah, there's the circle button. Okay, fire. Oh, good. It worked. <laughs> Wonderful. And then the next time she faces an enemy, she just looks at her controller and goes circle, and she pushes the circle button and beats the enemy. And then after, you know, a week or two weeks or three weeks, she just... Wanders up to the enemy, shoots the fire, and keeps on walking. And I'm just there observing, going, "Ah, I can see the progression. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, decades ago at this point. But it was just cute seeing the progression of someone who'd never played games before, Mm -hmm. getting that coordination, being able to control the camera properly, being able to land a tricky jump where they had no chance of doing it a few weeks beforehand. And Mm -hmm. it was always, here, Brendo, can you please do this jump for me? Because I (laughs) failed three times at it. In a row. I used to do that to you so many times when we first, <laughs> uh, when you first introduced me to Mass Effect and they had all those um, like hacking bits and stuff like that. It was like quick time button pressing, like yeah. it would flash up and I would always stuff those up and I'd panic. So I would just shove the controller at you. That or if I, there was a boss fight that I was got too like anxious with. My how times have changed. You're incredibly right when it comes to quick time events. All right. A, B, X, Y, X. And if you've just picked up the controller for the first time, you're like, mm-hmm. what, do, what? what was that? I just saw letters on a screen. What did it spell? <laughs> a back squeaks. <laughs> I don't know what that is. But as you get familiar with the controller, your brain just goes, dunk, 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 dunk. And mm-hmm. you just push the buttons and you're like, that, would, that was easy. <laughs> Some of that coordination can correlate into real life as well, as mm-hmm. far as just being able to pick up on things a little bit faster and uh, memorization skills also improving. Yes. So there is a lot to be credited as far as that helping grow the brain, and it's also linked with a lot of puzzle games too, as far as keeping it sharp. Mm-hmm. Another point for video games. Good work, games. <laughs> like I said, you just get better at everything, and that's why I'm so good at board games and art and 100 meter sprints and everything else. It's all because of video games. (laughs) 
One thing that has helped me personally is attention to detail. Mm -hmm. Doing a lot of puzzle games, uh, there have actually been studies that prove that people who play games kind of similar to, um, was it Bejeweled Blitz and uh, Candy Crush even, those kind of color matching games help you imp uh pick up on little details in a room. So, for example, when I walk into a room, I can see if there is a spider somewhere, like, almost immediately. It's this weird, <laughs> freaky thing, and, it like, Brenda's like, how did you spot that? I'm like, how did you not? Uh, but that's how my brain has been trained after years of playing those games, and there are studies that have shown that that works for a lot of other people, too, that are similar to me. So being able to absorb small details, even kind of subconsciously uh -huh. is something that has been trained into my psyche and my brain from years of video games. How funny and freaky is that? There's a lot of things in life where you do that. Your brain scans an environment for something in particular. If you've lost your keys or you can't find your wallet, mm -hmm. you'll go through the house and you'll be looking everywhere and sometimes you'll spot it and sometimes you'll walk straight past it and it's on the bench. <laughs> um, I think that practice makes perfect when it comes to these sort of things as well. Totally. And I like Where's Wally? Or where's Waldo? And I think games may be better at that too. Uh, it's Wally. Wally is the original name. Waldo is the uh, Americanized name. Well, how do you explain his yellow and black counterpart as being Odd Law, which is Waldo backwards? I don't know, but I do know that Wally was around first. So there's oh, that. There you go. There's Wally. Another thing that I think is a big plus for video games is the real life history lessons that they teach us. <laughs> I wish that history in school could have been this interactive and engaging. Well, it may be in this uh, this day and age with Maybe technology and VR headsets. You could walk through the Colosseum with lions attacking you. <laughs> um, just just the exact part of history that I really wanted to experience. Perfect. Being a martyr. <laughs> yep. Um, but there are many games. We've explained this very recently, actually. The fact that history is far more interesting when you're learning about the political rivalry that's happening with the Borgia clan mm -hmm. in Renaissance... Italy. Italy, yes. <laughs> I did, it, it's been a fair few years since I played Assassin's Creed 2. I just figured you'd know from the name that that was an Italian name, that's all. <laughs> Keep going. Um, but there's heaps. Even playing Vampire, seeing that immediately post-World War One. London, England, mm -hmm. and seeing the people coming back from war, where were they fighting? In France. Well, there you go. I didn't pay much attention to World War One details, but that's one thing that now I know. I mean, I learned a lot about World War Two in particular mm. due to the early Call of Duty games, Medal of Honor, the games that then went on to do all different types of shooter elements, but there are a lot of World War Two video games that helped me learn the history of who was on this side, who was on that side. When did this country join the war? What happened at Pearl Harbor? These are the things I learned from video games, mm. not history books. And whether that's just my my avenue to learning that, whereas other people might have learned things through movies, mm -hmm. um, any, any bit of fiction that's set somewhere in history that sort of lightly takes from it, you have to be careful what is actually fact and what is just creative license. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that uh, Forerunner history and creatures like Minerva actually existed <laughs> in the Assassin's Creed timeline in real life, but we'll let that just slide a little bit. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, even with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which definitely leans heavily into the mythology aspects of Greek history. Mm -hmm. uh, still had a lot of historical figures throughout it. You know, you get to see... <laughs> like Testicles. <laughs> I'm sure he was important in history. <laughs> no. Uh, but Socrates, or Socrates, however you want to say his name, uh, seeing him there debating in the forum and things like that mm -hmm. was just so cool. And it's like, wow, it makes, you know, names that get thrown around so often in culture and in throughout history, like, more real. And I feel like a lot of media is good for that as far as helping uh, figures that have lived and uh, have been gone for a very long time feel more like real people that we can actually connect to, because they were. Instead of just a name in a textbook, you're yeah. seeing Leonardo da Vinci. Exactly. And you're seeing Captain Kidd. And you're seeing, you know, George Washington. 
mm-hmm. the tyranny of King Washington, which is like a spin-off DLC of Assassin's Creed Three. Or you're those helping. Those events didn't happen. You're helping them dump tea into the. <laughs> <laughs> the I've done it. I was up. part of the Boston Tea Party. Exactly. In Assassin's Creed Three. So many different things. Sir Francis Drake asked me who that was beforehand. I would have said no idea. I play Uncharted, and now I know he was an explorer. I know mm-hmm. he was, you know, liked by this country, hated by this country. And I know for a fact that he died in El Dorado finding the City of Gold. Which one of those is not actually true? I'll let you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> And then you've even got other video games that are almost designed to be really history lessons, mm-hmm. like Valiant Hearts. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, you've got some fictitious characters that uh, bring kind of more of a, I guess, a novel story through all the history lessons. But it gives you facts. And on this date, exactly this happened. Yes. And it's taking you from this point to this point to this point uh, while you go through the platform. And done so well and so heartbreakingly, you know... Uh, a game that if I was going to force like a lot of tweens to learn about the Great War, I'd make them play that. Mm-hmm. I agree completely. And even things like the Cold War. How much did you learn about the Cold War when you watched me play Metal Gear Solid 3? <laughs> Honestly, the most I learned from that game was just don't trust any form of government when it comes to military because they're all <laughs> corrupt. There you go. A life lesson for everyone. Don't <laughs> trust the government. They're up to something. <laughs> The Philosopher's Legacy, it's all well, they want. When they start blaming video games for things. Yeah, obviously another game that's set during a historical situation with the you know Cuban Missile Crisis, all these sort of things that actually almost caused World War Three. There's some fictional characters. I'm sure there wasn't a man made of bees in the real Cold War, but Metal Gear Solid 3 still taught you enough real facts about the political situation that existed and how tense it was, how much of a tightrope was walked, that any step either way would have caused a nuclear explosion Mm. between countries. We're learning all sorts of things about games. And, of course, if you are doing an exam at the moment about Cold War, don't forget to write about the Shagohard, the giant walking battle tank that was the precursor (laughs) to Metal Gear. (laughs) Or maybe ignore that. (laughs) Uh, unless your teacher knows about Metal Gear Solid, you might get bonus points for mentioning that. There you go. Just, you know, sometimes teachers like a cheeky answer occasionally. Depends on your teacher. Mm-hmm. Going back to uh, some more, like, practical things we've learnt from video games, and that, I would say, is patience and tenacity, especially mm. the old school games that we grew up with where you would be... Uh, ruthlessly killed off and had to start from the very beginning and go all the way back through. Uh, That definitely teaches you patience or triggers your deep-seated rage, one or the other. (laughs) Especially with The Lion King recently uh, making it to the cinemas in its CGI form. People have been sharing footage of the Sega Genesis version of The Lion King. Uh, A notoriously difficult game. (laughs) Unfair to the point of frustrating... Every gamer that ever attempted it back in the day, um, I will take up pretty much any video game challenge that gets thrown at me. Please never challenge me to try and beat that game because I will hate you forever. Um, These games were short back in the day and you would have to have a degree of patience Mm -hmm. and Mm self-control and not throw the controller when you lost again. (laughs) But they did teach perseverance they did help you learn and adapt with the patterns of the enemies okay that enemy jumps this one doesn't i've just jumped into the enemy that jumps and died so i'll go under that enemy i'll jump over the next one and now i've been fallen in a hole because that was a fake floor okay next time i play the game i'm going to go under the first enemy over the second enemy jump over the false floor and an arrow just got dropped on my head from a guy in a cloud okay next time i play the game (laughs) you had to learn and adapt but you also had to have character Mm-hmm. And patience. Yep. Especially in my household, any tantrums, the master system went off instantly. <laughs> so I've always been a well behaved gamer, and even now, many decades later, the worst you'll get from me is a muttering under my breath and maybe, just maybe, not a throw, but just an underarm toss of the controller into a beanbag. Sorry for my outburst of rage. Even in modern gaming, there are still plenty of games that test our patience and tenacity. Like vampires loading screens. (sighs) (laughs) 
Oh, I don't know. How about anything from From Soft? <laughs> yes. Bit of Bloodborne, Dark Souls, Sekiro. And again, that's all about adapting and learning mm-hmm. from failure, mm-hmm. which you have to do in life sometimes. Yes. I mean, There's I've, another lesson, really. I've been cooking more recently, which does involve a degree of learning and adapting from your mistakes. <laughs> Maybe a bit too much of that spice this time. Next time, I'll back off a little bit on it. I've just put in two tablespoons of something instead of teaspoons. I'll pay double attention to that next time as well. (laughs) In life, you will make mistakes and hopefully you learn from it and have enough patience and long-suffering to adjust and adapt and try better next time. Don't beat yourself up about it. Um, These are things you've picked up from video games. Mm -hmm. From being whooped by Father Gascone in Bloodborne for the 12th time. As you almost got him that time, but just not quite. I'll learn and I'll adapt. I'll get better and I'll beat you next time. On a more whimsical note, since you mentioned it, I believe you've even learned literally some cooking skills from video games. Of course. Overcooked 2 has taught me that (laughs) ingredients left on the floor are just as good as the ones from the bench. (laughs) And to throw things or use flamethrowers in the kitchen is far more expedient. We'll do that at Christmas. We'll cook the turkey with flamethrowers. How about that? (laughs) Okay. It's way faster than, you know, the Weber. Uh, But seriously, though, you had made a meal for me. Like, I think when we were dating, you had your DS (laughs) and there was this game. It wasn't like... forgotten about this. I can't remember what it was called, but it was like this... It had recipes, like legit recipes and everything on it. And you tried one of them out on me. It was literally called Cooking God. There you go. I don't know if it's so don't much of a game. Don't know what to eat. But it was on the DS and so you tried it. How, how gamer of me is that? <laughs> I got married not knowing how to cook pretty much anything except maybe <laughs> spaghetti bolognese. And anything that could be put in the oven. So instead of buying a cookbook, what did I do? I bought a DS game with recipes in it. And you don't know what to cook? Here's some suggestions. What yep. sort of ingredient would you like? I choose this one. Okay. You still have that, right? S- somewhere in the house. I don't. I think I've used it since I cooked for you that time. I would like you to try one of those recipes this week. <laughs> <laughs> Dig something out. I think that should be added to gaming goals. Bit of precursor there, but there before I forget. <laughs> frequently games that get dug up from the archives in this house that I'm like, I haven't thought about this game in 15 years. I'm going to play mm-hmm. it again this weekend. I have not thought about that cooking game in quite a long time. But did you know people have tried to replicate dishes from video games? As strange as it sounds, uh, obvious ones that come to mind. Behemoth Steak. From Final Fantasy fifteen. I was, no? <laughs> was going to say Final Fantasy fifteen because there are other recipes that are actually more realistic because mm-hmm. there's a few Japanese dishes that like are Toasted featured. sandwiches. <laughs> Cup noodle. <laughs> True gourmet experience. <laughs> Stop saying gourmet. It's gourmet. <laughs> I've been doing it deliberately to annoy a friend of ours and now it's stuck and you're going to say it wrong forever just like you say bur- birthday instead of F. birthday. Oh, dear. <sighs> but yes. People have taken the the meals and things from video games and then recreated it. So that's a positive influence in my mind of, you know, taking the time to learn a new meal or at least learn how to cook and being inspired by your favourite video game or a game. You've heard it here first on the Gaming Lovers podcast. You will be a better cook <laughs> if you play you video would. games. I didn't say One hundred percent lock it <laughs> in, Eddie. There's no guarantee. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, for me, one thing that I have really gotten from video games over the years is creativity. Mm. Whether that be building a metropolis in SimCity only to destroy it with, you know, Godzilla later. Oh, you violent video game, are you? <laughs> That's how I dealt with the crippling debt that eventually hit me because I didn't know how to manage money back then. <laughs> oh, there's another thing. I manage finances digitally a lot better than I did as a kid. By typing in motherload into the Sims. <laughs> if only there was a cheat for that in real life. Or a money tree at the very least. What was that about ethical decisions? <laughs> Is it wrong to cheat in games? Well, who knows? <laughs> Oh, dear. Um, There are so many, like, artsy games now that I would have loved as a kid, Mm. like drawing ones. Uh, There are little ones that teach you how to paint or draw and sketch, mostly on the DS, because it's very kid-friendly. Touchscreen, stylus, basically a pencil and a paper. Didn't have so many of those when I was younger, but I, I look at those now and I'm like, man, as a kid I would love that. I'm like, I wouldn't really 
get as into them now. But there are still other creative outlets. When I was playing Fallout 4 Mm -hmm. and you had the chance to, like, build settlements and things like that. Yep. Oh, did my interior designer for, you know, the (laughs) post-apocalyptic world really come out in me. I had so much fun. I'm like, okay, over here is where we'll have the mountain of turrets. And then here we will have a nice kind of college-esque feel with like bunk beds. And it'll be kind of a shared co-ed experience there. And over here is going to be more private little mini houses or villas for couples. And Darling, I'm redoing the living room. Would you like rusted metal or burnt oak as our wall? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, it really could do with a bit more pop of colour. They don't really give you much option as far as that. But it was so much fun. I poured so much time into that Mm -hmm. side of the game. Uh, And, yeah, it it was almost like another game within the game. So there are definitely outlets for creativity and thinking outside the box. Games like Minecraft, I think, are a really good boon for that as far as people recreating literal cities in the world or other video game landscapes within Minecraft or just Mm -hmm. really fun, silly things. Like, they're taking the time and skill and doing some pretty awesome stuff with it. I had Sonic the Hedgehog comics growing up and I thought I was going to be a comic artist as a result of that because I loved Sonic. And I would create new characters. Mm. Like, all right, what could be a... Sonic's a hedgehog, but what if there was a porcupine? How would he look? Like, what sort of... What would a character in this style look like as a porcupine? Mm -hmm. Or as a duck? Or as a flying squirrel? And then there was actually a flying squirrel (laughs) character, so I didn't realise that out at the time. It already existed, but I only discovered him many years later. (laughs) But those sort of things. Creative outlets. Thinking new ideas and... You know, like you said, interior design from video games. Mm -hmm. Who knows what sort of passions have been inspired by games? What sort of worlds have people actually thought of? What new IPs and book Mm. series have just started because someone was playing Final Fantasy IV and goes, oh, this this magical fantasy world, but what if it was like this instead of that? Mm -hmm. Oh, my, oh, my, my brain's exploding with ideas. I've always loved the idea of combining Pokemon and Final Fantasy. I'm like... Having a slightly more, I guess, adult-centered kind of combat and storyline, but still with the fun of Pokemon kind of intermingled, would always be really cool. And like, I'm like, <laughs> part of me is like, I could write it, but I want someone else to do it because I'm lazy. <laughs> we should have said that about the uh, the strategic thinking and things. Pokemon, forget rock paper scissors, forget <laughs> rock paper lizard scissors Spock. <laughs> We've got like 18 types of Pokemon that are all strong and weak to each other. Mm-hmm. This is, you got to think. If you're playing a simple kids game, you, you got to think mm-hmm. of which things to use. That's more complicated than it seems. <laughs> Same as like Kingdom Hearts. But anyway, we're uh, on a tangent again. Uh, I love that another great side of that creativity, I think, is not just what you can do in-game, but what bleeds out, like you were saying with books and art, but like, mm-hmm. or like comics. But fan art, cosplay, uh, even, dare I say, fan fiction, like all these amazing creative (laughs) outlets, though, Mm -hmm. that are being inspired by video games and that get brought to life and people are getting to uh, try out new things or try and test their talents uh, because they want to show their passion and love for these, you know, what could be said is one art appreciating another art. Mm Mm-hmm. So. There are many different outlets for creativity that stem mm-hmm. from video games, and I'm all for it. Absolutely. But probably the greatest thing, the obvious answer, the number one benefit I have found in my life from being a video gamer is connecting with common interests with other video gamers. Mm. Pretty much everyone at the top of my sphere of friends plays some sort of video game, Mm -hmm. and because I have, not to brag, but such a wide variety of interests in games, I have friends that I've bonded with over horror video games, Mm -hmm. I've had friends that I've bonded with over RPGs, I've had friends that I've bonded with over Pokemon, I've had, you know, a, a lovely friend who became my girlfriend, who became my wife, <laughs> and a large, large factor in that was our common interest 
in video games. Totally. And that has grown, and we have been like, you have to play this game, it's incredible. And you play that game, and you're like, it was incredible. Now we can talk about it. Mm-hmm. How good was this? And I think that having a common shared interest with anyone is a factor of why you connect as a person. Mm. But the community can be toxic in some aspects of video gaming, but the majority rule, I think, is that... If you like something and someone else likes something, you're going to like each other yeah, totally. more than you did before you found out they liked that thing. Absolutely. And I think the gaming community could be a little less toxic if we just had the attitude that even if they like a game that I don't like, I can still respect that. Like, I don't have to belittle them for liking something that I don't get as into mm-hmm. or appreciate. But, yeah, some people just will put their thing in a bubble and be like, my my version of gaming is the ultimate version and the only version of gaming I will accept. Um, we've had one or two friends that were like that. And thankfully, they've kind of grown a little bit over the years. There's one friend who we used to argue was very Nintendo-centric. Mm-hmm. And he's very recently started realizing that there are other good games out there that <laughs> are on other consoles and platforms and such. So... It's been nice to see a little bit of um, growth there, I guess. So I I hope more people can do that too and just, yeah. Even if you don't like a game, you can still respect that somebody else does and has fun with that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm almost always willing to... If any of my friends say, oh, I've just played this game and you have to try it, I'm like, all right, it's not my cup of tea, but I'll give it a shot and... Who knows? Maybe it's the next great thing that I didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. And just by doing that, I think a big factor of our relationship of why it has been so strong has been that willingness to try the other person's interests. Mm -hmm. You were not a wrestling fan when we started dating, (laughs) but now quite often you're the one who wants to watch it. And for me, I had no interest in musicals, but as our relationship (laughs) went on and I got subjected to many of them, uh, I've found an appreciation for them that Mm -hmm. I didn't have before, and that has helped us grow stronger. Video games, 100% can be the same, and I have found them to be a great factor in making new friends, strengthening current friendships, or even reigniting old friendships that we haven't seen each other in 20 years, but we used to play Donkey Kong Country together and, oh, look, it's like we never left off. Well, just think of um, all of the esports and expos that you can go to and meet other fellow gamers Mm -hmm. and you can have this instant bond with people. Uh, It's like going to a convention and just meeting some kindred spirits that then can become good friends over time that you never would have met otherwise. I love hearing stories about how people met, you know, the person that they ended up marrying at places like that or playing Pokemon Go and stuff like that, you know, when Mm -hmm. they're all at a raid and they're helping each other and making friends. Well, I made a new friend just the other day at a ramen place in the city because he was playing Pokemon Go. I was playing Pokemon Go. He was from Japan. I'm from Australia. We had very little in common, except for our mutual love of ramen, (laughs) and the fact we were both playing Pokemon Go, and we became Pokemon Go friends right then and there. Mm -hmm. Tomodachis (laughs) for life. Which is the word for friend in Japanese, by the way. (laughs) But even there's even one of the weirdest friendships I've ever had was with someone who was a complete stranger. Game Traders used to be a store around here before they went bust, Mm. and they had a Facebook post that said, what is your favourite game ever? And I went on there to proclaim the good news about the underappreciated game that no one had ever heard of, called Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors, the first game in what became the Zero Escape series. Mm -hmm. The sequel had come out. I didn't have a 3DS, and it was the only thing it was available on. I'd never played it. And I went there to talk about 999 is the greatest game I've ever played. Puzzles were great. Story was great. Plot broke my mind. It was so great. And I went there, and there was a girl who had already posted almost exactly what I was about to say. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Someone else has played 999. This is fantastic. And so I messaged her out of the blue and said, my wife is probably going to get me a 3DS. Um, Is Virtue's last reward, like, is it as good as or somewhere near 999. That's all I want to know about it. You've played it. 
you've said you've played both. I just want to know that it's sort of in that wheelhouse because I'm scared I'll have my hopes up too high and it'll just be crushed. And I heard nothing because I messaged a stranger. Who expects a response? <laughs> and then after I'd already got my 3DS and I had played Virtue's Last Reward, I got a message back from this lady and she said, sorry, because we weren't friends, it didn't show up on my thing. I didn't get a notification for it. I love Nine Persons, Nine Hours, Nine Doors. I love Virtue's Last Reward. If it's not too late, you should absolutely play it. And I messaged her back saying, I did play it and it was incredible. And then we became pen pals for like eight years. (laughs) (laughs) Just talking about, oh my gosh, I tried this game called Danganronpa and I think you'd like it based off what I've talk to you about games before and then she tries and she's like oh my gosh the PS Vita is so good Mm -hmm. and I only bought one because uh, you told me about how these games are like this have you tried Trails of Cold Steel I'm like oh my gosh I love Trails of Cold Steel (laughs) and we were like best friends I've never met her face to face (laughs) and we met because of a common interest in games Mm -hmm. and oh good stuff good stuff and if you weren't married maybe you would have met her face to face (laughs) And that would have been your story. <laughs> well, she had a fiancé at the very least, so it was never on the table. Until along came Brendo. Right? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't make it weird and put jealousy in the mix. I'm it was a warm, jealous. uplifting story. <laughs> I do find it funny, though, uh, with you became friends with one of my co-workers back when I worked at the radio station. This is going back nearly a decade now. Uh, with Kel. Mm-hmm. Because... You bonded over Mass Effect. Yes. And I believe that was back when we were dating, that you two uh, would, you'd come to visit me at the radio station and then you would just spend ages <laughs> talking to Kel about Mass Effect. Like, and that's all you did. And then we would start talking about Deus Ex Human Revolution. Yes. And there were quite a few games and sure enough, a bond was made and you, through video games. You were better friends with one of my work colleagues than I was. <laughs> <laughs> So anytime like we had to talk, he'd be like, "So how's Brendo?" I'm like, he's good. How, how far has he got in this game? I think he's beaten it. Oh, good. <laughs> I can talk to him about it next time I see him. <laughs> Friendships with only video games and interest as a common interest. That's that's good stuff. You can still build a friendship there, and it may develop to a deeper level down the road. I've had friendships that you may start... level up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, you made a bad joke. But I've had friendships that started off completely shallow. Mm. I'm not even going to try and dilute it. Hey, come over. We'll play this game together. Okay. And that's all it was. Mm -hmm. We didn't care about each other's family lives or what our past history was with this trauma or that event in my life or who I'm interested in romantically or all this sort of things. Mm -hmm. Starts off completely shallow. And then as years go on, now I trust them with any secret that I have because that's how close we've become. You never know where the next friendship's going to start mm-hmm. from video games. Who knows? Who knows? And uh, with online features and being able to meet in the community, I mean, there are some negatives that do come with that, but there are definitely plenty of pluses as well. Mm-hmm. So I would say we've learned a lot and we've been uh, blessed with a lot as far as video games more things just keep coming to mind the more we talk about it. You're like, yeah. yes, I've learned this and I've gotten <laughs> this out of it. And uh, it's kind of been nice to reflect on that and bring some positive back in after a lot of really dark news. So we hope that uh, video games have been uh, a source of fun and encouragement and learning and all those other great things in your life as well. And if there's anything that they've done for you that we may have missed or overlooked, then let us know at thegaminglovers.com. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself. It's like you're a gaming lover, and I am too. After the break, we'll be talking about what our future gaming goals will be. What are we planning on playing this week? What video games will expand our minds and our abilities in this uh, day and age? We'll find out after this. Going to cook me some Brahmin steak. That's what you're going to do. Brahmin. Share the love. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the gaming lovers. I'm going to say four words to you. I just want a yes or no. Fire emblem, three houses. What about it? Is it what you're going to play this week? (laughs) Uh, Yes. (laughs) This is going to be quite a problem because you only, you don't like playing the game in portable mode. No, because I don't like using the Joy-Cons. I like the Pro Controller. 
There are some games I don't mind streaming to my laptop or playing in a different room Mm -hmm. without the surround sound system, Mm -hmm. like I did with some of the side quests in Vampire while you were playing Fire Emblem Three Houses. But guess what? Brendo's in the house now for two (laughs) weeks, and I do not want these two weeks to become heated and contested over the use of the main TV and surround sound well, system. Well, I'm not going to suggest rock, paper, scissors because <laughs> <laughs> my uh, record has been abysmal against you with that. So let's let Smash Bros decide. <laughs> <laughs> the old way we'd pick what movie we're playing. Yeah, put it on the AI and let them have at it. Uh, in all seriousness, though, I was thinking while I play... Fire Emblem Three Houses, you can play Persona Q2. And then when you want to play Red Dead, I can find something else to do. I am not on holiday, so there is that. Mm. I also tend to uh, enjoy sleeping in. Even though you work later shifts, sometimes I... I, I still get up later. <laughs> How can I word I this without making me sound completely lazy? Um... <laughs> when you work late, though, I can't sleep until you get back. I'm like... As soon as I hear you come inside the house, I'm like, okay, good, he's safe, he's alive. (laughs) K.O. Yeah, my morning time is my Brendo solo gaming time quite often, but uh, I I don't mind that. A few hours. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. There's your time to play Red Dead. No. (laughs) You were asking for time for the TV to yourself, and I promise you will still get some good chunks in there. Well, I've got two weeks off. I'm going to try and beat Red Dead Redemption 2. It mm-hmm. was on hold for a little bit while I fiddled around with the Xbox Game Pass. Oh, one other gaming goal I forgot to mention. I played Hello Neighbor, and it is the worst game I've ever played. So, <laughs> so you stopped playing Hello Neighbor? Yes. Okay. I played it for a grand total of about 12 minutes and never want to play it again. And that's coming from someone who's pretty generous with which games he will play. Mm. Uh, <laughs> to that. It was so bad I repressed the memory earlier when I thought, what did I play this week? <laughs> well, my challenge to you mm-hmm. is to dig up that old DS game with the oh, cooking gosh. recipes mm-hmm. and replicate one. It can Done. be super easy, I don't mind. But It'll I, be my choice. And I want you to document it at least, like parts of the process, whether it be photos or short videos, something that we can share on social media. MasterChef. Yes. Brendo edition. <laughs> Gamer edition. Uh, I want to see if these recipes are any good. Well, that's conditional, provided I can find it, because I'm not buying a second copy of that <laughs> if I can't. I wonder if someone copied those recipes and posted them online. Oh, I don't know. I like to play games. I don't watch <laughs> YouTube would that footage be, of other people playing games. Would that count games. as like a, an emulation? <laughs> taking a recipe off a video <laughs> game? <laughs> Here's our Let's Play of Cooking Guide. <laughs> with commentary. Oh, that's so funny. Live stream that bad boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do plan on trying to beat uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 over the course of the next two weeks. It will probably be my primary game. However, there are a few extra spanners in the work. Mm-hmm. In the work. Spanner in the works. Spanners in the work. <laughs> Mucked that up. I don't care. Throw a spanner in there. Yes. <laughs> The spanner went into words, not the words. <laughs> I have managed to also play a little bit of Silent Hill 3 with my good buddy the Falcon this past week. I'll save the thoughts on that until we beat it, which should be this week as well. Okay. So we've got a we've got a schedule penciled in, a gaming session penciled in there. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we'll beat Silent Hill 3 in our quest to marathon the entire Silent Hill series, which took a bit of a hiatus due to work schedules. But also, after hearing a little snippet of last week's podcast where uh, you accused me of having hydrophobia, (laughs) and my good buddy the Falcon heard that, (laughs) and here I was bragging about, oh, I'm not afraid of when I go underwater in games, but he played Subnautica and he was terrified. (laughs) Can you guess how that has bit me in the butt? Now you have to play Subnautica. My good buddy the Falcon has officially challenged me to play Subnautica. Hmm. However, sometimes we like to watch each other play games. When we've played Until Dawn, for example, I've played it solo and then invited him over and he's played it while I judge his every choice and decision. (laughs) Like you did with us with Heavy Rain, like we did to you with Detroit Become Human. Now the benefit of that is you get to laugh when an upcoming jump scare, you're like, I know exactly what's going to happen as soon as they try and open this door and then you see your friend go, and you're like, ha ha, that was funny. (laughs) 
But on the other side of the coin, it's not as scary when you have your friend sitting next to you laughing and making jokes with you and it takes the tension away. Mm. So he wants to watch me play Subnautica, but he does not want to be present (laughs) to affect... (laughs) The uh, terror and isolation that I feel. Uh And as a result, we have come to the decision that I will be live streaming my Subnautica adventures throughout the next two weeks at the very least. Mm -hmm. Maybe an hour here, maybe an hour there, maybe big sessions, maybe small sessions, but it will all be documented on my YouTube page. Just look for Hyper Brendo and you too can also laugh at me as I get horribly terrified of venturing thousands of metres into the depths. The link to Brendo's uh, live streaming page, which hasn't really been updated in a while, uh, work. is on our website at thegaminglovers.com. You can find all the links to our social media pages and stuff there as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing that and laughing from a distance. At first I thought, yeah, it'll be fun. And then you can sit by me and, you know, relax me a bit. We'll have some fun. But no, he wants me to be isolated and alone, which is the whole point of the Subnautica experience. Mm. So, mummy. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I do a podcast where all of my words are recorded and can then be used against me? <laughs> oh, it's like karma's come back full circle on me. Mm-hmm. Uh in all of this activity that you have planned, mm-hmm. we are we going to attempt divinity at all? I'll do some research and I'll make an actual game plan for us to get into that temple before we do it. I'm usually against guides. I think but in we this need case, one. <laughs> I really think we need one. I'm gonna do the guiding. So we will play some Divinity this week. I can't not do some cooperative gaming with my wife while I'm actually home mm-hmm. and able to. Yes. So let's do that at some point. And that seems to be our plan. Yep. Anything else on your radar this week apart from Divinity and uh, Three Houses? I don't know. I've got to think of something I can play if I get banished from this, the uh, gaming room. Banished. So uh, nothing comes to mind off the top of my head. Uh, but if anything new does pop up... I guess I'll be filling you in next week when we do gaming goals then. How about that? Look forward to my update next week where I officially report I haven't played any of those games because I bought six other new ones. (laughs) And we will catch you next week. I've been Brendo. I've been Jem. And we've been the gaming lovers. Chowski. Bayonara. And farewell. What? You can't say that. I can have two. No. I can have two parting shots. Get out. Okay, but I'm going for the TV. Get out of my way. I need to play games. Thanks for listening to the Gaming Lovers Podcast. For more episodes or to watch some live stream gaming, visit thegaminglovers.com.